everyone and welcome to one, one more of our Hobby Memorial Library virtual events. We have today um, a very special person, uh, Mr. John Chella. He is the chairman of CTC's Protective Services and he's going to be answering a lot of questions today for us. We've had students asking the librarians these questions and we didn't know the answer, so we figured we probably should just go ahead, go to the source and find a lot of information from him as well. So welcome, Mr. Chella. How are you? Good morning. Thank you for having me. Okay. Well, um, we had a video made. Uh, Chris Link had made the video and um, we were going to show that video first that might answer some of the questions and then we'll get into the questions. Does that sound okay? Yeah, that sounds great, thanks. Okay, all righty. So let's get started on our video. Hi, my name is Crystal Link. I am with the Central Texas um, College Protective Services Department. Here in the department, we have three um, programs under us. We have criminal justice, which is the most popular one. We have the police academy, and we have the newest one, which is fire service administration. So a little bit about the criminal justice department. We are one of the longest standing departments in, um, in the college. So we were here when the college was erected a long time ago. Um, and we currently have two AAS degree plans under us, and then we have a certificate of completion under us. Um, the criminal justice AAS um, is basically the generalized degree plan for criminal justice. That's the one that's going to get you a broad scope of everything. It'll get you, um, it'll get you in the door to kind of, it'll serve as a baseline for you. The corrections specialization degree plan is more so geared towards corrections. So that is for those who want to go on and do things with um, prisons or jails or such. So there's a little bit of a difference between the two, but both are equally good degree plans. Um, and then the um, criminal justice studies with specialization, that is the corrections um, certificate of completion. So it is a piggyback off of this degree plan. However, this is just a, um, it, will, it will take the place, you'll only take the criminal justice side of it, but you won't be taking your core classes. So this is just a shorter route of this one. We have fire service administration, which is one of our newer babies in the department. Um, so we have, we offer um, a couple of different degree plans. There are some that are only um, offered outside of Texas, so you need to make sure that you are aware of that. And when I say outside of Texas, I really mean they're only offered in our Europe campus as of right now. So if you're military and looking at this, um, and you're stationed in Europe, this could be up your alley. So fire protection and fire, um, the fire protection degree plan and the certificate plan are only offered in Europe. And then we have our fire service administration degree plan, which is offered here at our central campus. And we also have a fire protection technology certificate plan that is also offered here in Texas. The program is still new and upcoming. We are ever evolving. So we are, as of right now, we are in the process of getting classes built. We're in the process of getting some great instructors on to get to, um, to teach our students. So definitely be on the lookout for those classes here, hopefully in the spring semester of 2022. So that would be a great program. This program is more so geared for anybody that is already a firefighter, but is welcome to those who are not a firefighter yet. The difference in this program, because a lot of people say, what is the difference? Well, the difference is this program is if you're a firefighter and wanting to do any leadership role, um, you will be able to take these classes and then you will be able to transfer into a leadership role in a fire department. Um, whereas if you were looking for a fire academy, you would have to actually go to a fire department, get a job, and they would send you to a fire academy. So that's a little bit of the difference. So this is one of our most popular um, attractions here in the Protective Services Department is our police academy. It is a credit and non-credit course. People say, what is the difference between non-credit and credit? Well, a credit course means that you are obtaining college credit. So that is a clock, or no, I'm sorry, a credit hour for the class. The um, police academy is currently offered at 24 credit hours if you started the academy after 2019. Anything 2019 and before, it was 23 credit hours, but after that it was changed, bumped up to one. Um, if you are here for non-credit, that means that an agency has sent you 
to the academy, which means you have obtained a job and they have sent you here, so they are paying you to be here as well as paying your tuition and all other associated costs. We also offer a jailer course as of right now that is only agency sent. Um, we are in the works of trying to get that to become a credit class again so that way we can offer it to the public. Also, we have a telecommunicator course here as well. Again, with the jailer class same concept, we are offering it right now only for those who are being sent by an agency, but hopefully in the near future, we can also get that to where we can offer it um, to all students and you'll be able to come in here, get your license first, and then go out and get that job. So here's some common questions on the Academy and I'll also answer a, answer a couple other, I'm sorry, that are not up here. Um, it says, how old do I have to be to attend the Academy? To the state of Texas, you have to be 21 years or older. Um, if you are going to be 20, um, unless you're going to be 21 prior to the state exam. So if I am 20 and I'm taking my state exam on August 20th, I have to be 21 before August 20th or I cannot come to that specific class. But you can start a class before you turn 21. You just have to be 21 before you take that state exam. Um, and then it says, do I have to finish the academy all at once or can I take it in sections? And again, I addressed that early in the video, but I could do it again. Um, you have to complete the academy all in one setting. So a lot of questions is, um, what does that mean? You have to take all five sections back to back simultaneously. It can't be you start today and finish in another two months or three months. Um, it says, I've been to the academy before, but I didn't finish. Can I pick off where I left off? That is a big question that some people get. Even if you haven't been to our academy and you go to an academy elsewhere in Texas, you still have to come and start entirely over. And that means all of the paperwork, that's the psychological, that's going to be the physical and the drug screen, the fingerprints, all that, the PHS has to be re completely redone because it has to be solidified by that academy. Each academy board, um, they set their own minimum standards. So we have to make sure not only are you meeting the minimum standards of our board, but you also have to meet the minimum standards of the state. So it is very important that you understand that you will have to start all the way over. Um, even if you've been to our academy before and you maybe for some reason had to leave the last month, you will have to come back and do it entirely over again. Um, and then it says, what type of funding do they accept for the academy? We will accept any kind of funding that is available to the academy. So um, I'm sorry, to the college. So we do accept financial aid um, again, and that is going to be ran through FAFSA. That is through the government. So we have no bearing on if you get accepted or not. Um, if you apply for financial aid, this is one of the biggest things that we tell our students. If you are going to our night academy, even the day academy, but more importantly, the night academy, you need to apply over two fiscal years. So you need to apply for the year that was prior and you need to apply for the year coming up. So for prime example, right now we were in the 21 fiscal year. My students need to apply for 2020 into 2021, and then you will need to apply for 2021 into 2022 to make sure that you are covered for the entire academy. Um, that is very important that you do that. If not, you will run into a um, kind of like a little hiccup towards the middle of the academy, especially with funding and trying to get everything processed. It is very important that you work with the financial aid office carefully and closely and listen to the things that they say to make sure that you can get your funding and especially on time. Um, and then we do accept the VA, we accept Hazelwood, we accept post 9-11, Montgomery, all of those things. When we say we accept it, we accept it as long as you are eligible for it. So our veterans, if you are eligible for, the, eligible for those services, please ensure that you have gotten with the necessary people to ensure that you have everything worked out. You're gonna need your certificate of eligibility, which is like a little eight by 11 piece of paper stating that, um, I use my name, I, Chris Link, am entitled to 36 months or two months or however many months. If you're gonna have something transferred over to you, we typically tell you allow for 30 to 60 days for the VA to process that um, because it does take a little time and they are backed up right now. A lot of people ask, when will I get my payment? My famous answer is, I do not know because unfortunately we don't have access to the VA system. So you would have to contact the VA. Our represent, or our office, I'm sorry, for this area is in Muskogee, Oklahoma, which um, most people should know, but if you don't, it's in Muskogee, Oklahoma, and you don't have to travel up there, but you can either write them, email them, or call them, and that information is available on va.gov. Um, and so you can get with them. If you are Hazelwood, if you're eligible for Hazelwood, that means you entered into the military in the state of Texas. So that means that you are eligible for um, that portion of the VA as well, and you can get with a counselor on how to get all of that taken care of. 
Um, we do take voc rehab as well. It's just very imperative that you work with your voc rehab counselor to make sure that you're staying on top of things and it's not going to mess anything up for you um, as far as degree plan. A lot of people say, well, hey, um, especially with the VA, I'm doing underwater basket weaving, for example. If you are doing that, you can do the academy, but they're going to make you pay for one or the other. So it is imperative that if you want to take a hold on that and you want to do the academy, that you let them know that you are switching your degree plan over so they can go ahead and get these classes taken care of. The college also does accept uh, credit card payments or check payments. If you make a check, you do have to have your driver's license um, present at the time when you want to disperse of the check. Um, and then they do other payment arrangements as well. We have a scholarship op office who is amazing. Right now we have Wendy um, over there in the scholarship office as well as Nicole. Um, I mean, not Nicole, I'm sorry, Michelle over in the scholarship office. That's our foundation office. They're amazing at getting scholarships. So if you need help, that is definitely an avenue that you can take. We also have a new scholarship um, that is being offered through the Robert L. Pettigrew Foundation. Um, it is for a fallen Bell County officer who uh, passed away uh, last year and his family has endowed money for students specifically to the academy to be able to pursue their dreams. So that is also another scholarship opportunity that you will find here in-house that is geared strictly towards our academy students. Um, so here's a couple of other questions that is commonly asked. How much does the academy cost? It is going to be dependent upon where you live, like I said before. In district, out of district is definitely a different cost. And then so is in state and out of state. Um, so it just depends on how they zone you uh, is, is how your tuition will be um, uh, based upon. Also, if CTC decides to raise the per credit hour, that is solely going to be based upon CTC. So the credit per credit hour may change. So please be aware, cognizant of the fact that we have no control over that. So you might start paying one cost and it could go up just by a little bit. Um, I've only seen it happen one time in the past five years, five years that I've worked here. So. Hopefully it won't happen too much, too many more times. Um, also, there's a $15 per hour fee that is extra on top for our course since we are a cert uh, certification course. So it's, it's going to be the per hour course plus an additional $15 per hour. So um, if it's 90 per credit hour, then you, do, you need to do 90 times or 90 plus 15. So that'll give you 105 and then you can times it all by there. Um, and if you know the per credit hour, just to back up, you can also times it however many credit hours is in the course, and that's exactly how you can find the cost of the course for any course here at CTC. Um, and so we, we touched on the, the different degree plan. Will it cover both? This is also goes for financial aid as well. They will not cover multiple degree plans. So if you are taking general studies and the police academy, you will be forced to do one or the other um, as far as for funding, but you can still work on both. Just understand they will only fund for one. Um, and that's just because of policies. Um, is this an online or face-to-face -face course? This is a face-to-face -face course only. Um, you do physically have to come here. The only way that we move to an online format, and again, COVID has brought that on, is if there is a COVID outbreak or for some reason we have to shut down due to COVID precautions, we will move you to a form which is what we use as WebEx or we will use Zoom, depending upon which is, uh, which is more comfortable for the instructor. Um, the night before or the day of, kind of depending on how it happened, um, we will get you a link and you will log into class from there. But almost 99% of the class is going to be in a face-to-face -face aspect. Um, is this a self-paced course? Because there are self-paced courses at a college. This is not a self-paced course, so it is very imperative that you know that um, we do move fast-paced here, especially the day academy. It is quick. You might learn a lesson today and take a test the same day. You might learn two or three lessons in a day and take a test for each one. So it's very important that you remember that this is not a self-paced course, but all of the staff here is amazing at assisting um, you with any questions or comments or concerns that you have, especially with the course material. We're, like I said, one big family. You can come to any of us and we will help you. So come down, call us, email us, um, and thank you for joining us today. And Mr. John Chella, our department chair, will answer any questions that you have. Thank you. We miss Krissa. Right. <laughs> yes, she gave us such great information. And, and so now it, it's your turn to answer some questions. Um, did you want to make any comment about what Krista said before we ask you some questions? 
Yeah, I just want to comment for those that are watching that video that uh, there is a lot of information in there. And uh, if we have a student that is interested in any of the programs, I would suggest that they contact us directly. Some of the, up, uh, some of the information uh, has been updated since the video was made. And uh, if they're interested in the police academy, they can contact the director. That's Cliff Osborne, the director of the police academy. Uh, he is here uh, about 20 hours a day. Uh, if it's about the program overall or anything in the program, they can contact me. <clears throat> phone number is 1608. <clears throat> uh, that's 526-1608. Or they can email us uh, at our first name, last name, <clears throat> sctcd.edu. I'm sorry, I don't know. I think I got the allergies uh, today. Um, but again, if they have a question that they think of later on after we have this little chat, um, contact us. We're always available, either by phone or by email. And I'm happy to talk to any student. If they want to come visit, that's that's great, too. We can have an appointment set up and then come visit us in the department. And we can also put that when we post this video, we can also put that in the comment section. So yeah, that'd be we'll helpful. Get yeah. Everybody. Yes, yes, we'll get. Well, that's what create, you know, created this partnership in that we had a lot of our students asking some questions that we weren't sure of the answers. So, um, is it okay if I go ahead and ask you some of these now? I'm not sure I have all the answers either, but you can ask me anything you would like. Just make it up. All right. No. <laughs> Well, Chris had said that you, um, you needed to be 21 to get into the uh, police academy. Is, is there a cap on age, like at the other end of the spectrum? No, usually there is not. Now, that is not set by state law. State law just says that you have to be 21, and that's, that is not 100% accurate because there are ways to get in at a, a younger age. But generally, the age is 21 to become a, a peace officer in Texas. The so age, the person, okay. The age, upper level age is dependent on the agency that you go to work for. If you go to work for the Texas Department of Public Safety to be a DPS trooper, they have no age limit. You can be 75 years old and go to become a DPS trooper. Probably wouldn't want to, but uh, you can. Um, some departments are uh, under civil service statutes, and they normally do have a uh, upper age limit. It could be 35, it could be 45, and that applies to the federal law enforcement as well. They want to make sure that when they hire you that they're going to get a good 20 or 25 years out of you, so they're not going to hire you at 70. Uh, but if you know where you want to go to work once you go to the academy, you need to check with that agency that's going to hire you and check that out before you go through that process. Well, and, and speaking of like just basic requirements, I'm, I'm five feet, like on a good day. And so, you know, um, there are jobs where like, I can't reach the top shelf or whatever. Um, and I know years ago, there used to be uh, physical limits as well. Do they still have physical limits for things like the firefighters, the police officers, or has, have they done away with that completely? No, yeah, there the are students are asking these. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, to go back to the very basic, their height and weight, uh, really immaterial. The key word that you always hear when you apply for a job is that your height and your weight have got to be, uh, you can't, that they don't want somebody that is five feet tall and 300 pounds, nor do they want somebody that's six foot five and 100 pounds. Um, if you can meet the physical requirement, and that would be, include things like uh, uh, different types of exercise, um, obstacle courses. Uh, here we use a rowing machine, so you have to, based on your age and other things, you have to meet that requirement for the rowing machine. Um, when you go to a law enforcement agency, they will have a requirement as part of the hiring process as well. So again, you have to go and ask who you want to work for, what is their physical requirement for me 
to be hired here. And, you know, it, it does count because if you cannot pass it, uh, you're not going to get hired. And that's in the military as well. It's kind of like a boot camp, huh? Uh, yes. It has PT. It does mm -hmm. have PT and it has a requirement that you pass the PT portion of the academy. So you get the whole six and a half months or if you go to, uh, to the XB POC, you get about 11 months to work on that. So if you come in here weak in uh, physical ability, you have time to work on that. Okay, great, great. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a minute. Um, did you have to learn, like, there's like a million laws out there. Did you have to learn all these laws before um, you became an officer or before you're in any of these, EMS, firefighter? No, <clears throat> I'll give you the answer that I tell all my students. You do not need to memorize, commit to memory, the Texas Penal Code. Uh, I don't know anybody that can do that. Uh, and if they try to do that, they probably make mistakes. What you have to learn is how to use the Texas Penal Code. You have to know where to look for the laws. You need to know uh, there are very common laws that are broken every day, like speeding, traffic offenses, uh, traffic accidents, burglary, theft, shoplifting. And as you work, you become very, very familiar with those. Uh, it might be a case that, uh, like some child abuse cases, you it may not be so clear to you. So before you make that arrest, you have to go and refresh your memory on the on the uh, elements of that crime to make sure that they are an arrestable offense. That you can get a complaint filed against the person. That a warrant can be issued, and that you can make the arrest on them. Um, I, I would not suggest anybody ever try to memorize all 11 titles of the Texas Penal Code, no. Is that like the Dewey Decimal System for librarians? <laughs> yes. This is why we put it, we put it in little nice little posters to remind <laughs> us. So I hear you. <laughs> well, um, so let me, I mean, I, the, some of these questions are not quite like in the same topic because we've been collecting them all this time. Um, someone wanted to know if there's actual ways to protect yourself in a dangerous situation. And I'm not exactly sure what that means. <laughs> are they talking about as an individual or as a peace officer? As, as a peace officer. Are, are, are you taught specific ways to um, protect yourself? Yes. In, 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 fact, this, in the police academy. In fact, in the police academy, we have uh, defensive tactics. Uh, the cadets go to the firing range and they have to pass that. Um, they get pepper sprayed. They know how to react once they're pepper sprayed. Uh, they are well prepared for the street. They are also well outfitted. It's not like um, a civilian being confronted by a bad guy in the street and they don't know what to do. The police officer, when they're confronted, they have been through that training. They know exactly what to do. And uh, use of force used by police officers is, uh, they, have the, they have the law behind them to be able to use force necessary to uh, take care of that problem. So they do have that advantage and uh, uh, they are well-trained. They know how to do that. They, they understand, they know the use of force continuum. Uh, and if necessary, they will take your life and they can take your life. Yeah. Um, so, um, cause we've got, you've got the EMS, you've got the firefighters, you've got the police academy. So there's a lot of areas I'm asking you about with this one. Um, if you are a, a police officer or EMS or a firefighter, um, do you also like, like, should you take, or do you take, um, medical allied health medical field questions or you almost have to be a doctor to be in any of these fields not be a doctor but you know have the training was that a question or a statement a question <laughs> should you uh, okay. be a doctor let, before you be any of these let, 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 let me clarify so let me, let me clarify some of that 
Okay. We do not we do not do anything with the EMT program in my department. Uh, EMT is under paramedicine here at CTC, which is under the Department of Health Services. Uh, the program is taught, the EMT program is taught in the nursing department. And that would apply more to firefighters than it would to police officers. But there are some agencies where you can go to work and be a firefighter, a paramedic, and a police officer all in the same job. Um, they're called public safety departments. So you go to work and you work a schedule where you're a firefighter for a certain amount of time and a time frame. Uh, you are always a peace officer. So you have those duties as well. And then you might be called on to uh, do EMT duty as well. So uh, they are very well rounded. It is very cost effective for municipalities to operate a department like that because they have all those related jobs uh, being done by one person. Uh, that is not really caught on across the board 100%, but there are a lot of municipalities that do operate like that. Um, peace officers can do some basic life-saving techniques, but that is not really the job of the peace officer. The peace officer today understands that they can get on the radio and call the EMTs and the ambulance service, and they can be there in a matter of, you know, minutes and it's better to provide the most life-saving support that you can but anything medical would then be handled by the EMTs or paramedics okay because I I was when I read that question I was really concerned too it's like how much do they need to learn <laughs> but but um I'm losing my light here so a similar question to that would be um, like the mental health field. Um, is it imperative that um, peace officers, firefighters, that they learn psychology, mental health issues? Because that's kind of been in the news lately. Uh, that is, that's a, that's a good question. That's, that's a, in the front of all the news today because of what's going on. <clears throat> and, uh, in the police academy, they do learn about mental health. Where there is a position in most every department for a mental health officer, and more and more training is going towards the mental health uh, question that you raised. So, um, you know, in the old days, 45 years ago, when I was a police officer, we didn't do that. We we did not handle that question. Never came up. Today. Everybody wants to ask that question. Everybody wants to know what about the mentally ill? How do you deal with them? Uh, things that we did in the past certainly do not apply today. So in the academy, they go through critical incident training. They also go through uh, how to hire, uh, how to hire, how to help the mentally um, challenge that might be a problem in society. So they do get that training, yes. Yeah, it seems like um, I, I was in the politi uh, the Citizens Police Academy, and we did have one lesson on, um, you know, talking someone down from yes. a crisis. Yep. And so it just seems like that would be part of your everyday, because if someone, you know, has something with an officer, there's a crisis right there. <laughs> it would be a crisis for me when I'm driving the speed limit. And I see an officer, I slow down five miles. Right, yes. That would be right. a crisis if he turned his light on for me. <laughs> That's right. I would need to have him talk me down. So you're going to see, you're so, going to see more and more of that in the future. Uh, um, you know, because we are aware of that, that issue and that problem. So you're going to see more training in that in every department. Okay. Well, um, so let me ask you, um, where, where I did do the police academy, they work 12-hour shifts and night shifts. Did you ever do 12-hour shifts and night shifts? And how did you do that? I worked 8-hour shifts, 10-hour shifts, 12-hour shifts, 24-hour shifts, day and night. I worked the midnight shift forever. Um, uh, it's unfortunate, that, but somebody has to work. We're open, uh, police are open 24 seven. 
not like the old days when they used to shut down at 11 o'clock and everybody went home. Uh, uh, the, the world society is open 24 hours a day. So are the police. Uh, there are people that like to work midnight shift. There are people that don't mind working on weekends. There are people that don't mind working 10 hour shifts because they get three days off. There are people that do not mind working 12 hours. They figure if you're going to be there for eight, you might as well be there for 12. And then you can have three days on, four days off, four days on, three days off. Uh, fits a lot of people's schedule. And uh, that applies especially to firefighters. They, they always work that type of three, four schedule. Um, uh, the downside of all of that, if you ever follow anything in the medical field, is that there is actually a syndrome called uh, shift work syndrome, which does impact your health after you do that for many, many years. I am a victim of that myself. And, um, well, that's why we have doctors, because they take care of that kind of problem for you. But uh, it, it does take its toll on you. It takes a toll on you physically. Uh, it can take a toll on you mentally, and it can take a toll on your family. I, I can see that. I mean, you know, firefighters, though, they get to sleep, right? <laughs> the police officers don't. That's right. <laughs> well, um, so um, with having, you know, that kind of a schedule, is there a shortage of um, police officers in, in, you know, this country? Uh, there currently is, yes, and it, but it's not because of the schedule. It's because of things that are going on in the world, um, things like defunding the police and other political uh, agendas that politicians have. But uh, I think most of the people that come to the academy, they understand because they learn from day one in the academy, hey, you know what, you're going to work uh, eight-hour shifts, you're going to work 10-hour shifts, 12-hour shifts, you're going to work on the midnight shift. Most of the cadets we get leave here they get hired they go to work on the midnight shift you know why because all the rookies have to fill in those voids that there are and those are on the midnight shift the people that have seniority when you get a rookie in the department are going to move to where they want to work so the seems like all the rookies always end up on the midnight shift and i'll tell you what it's a great place to learn it's a great place to train uh the night the, the night world is much different than the day world um I don't care if you live in Killeen or if you live in Lamp Passes or if you live in Ding Dong, Texas. Uh, when you turn the lights off, the world changes. Well, in, in that line, like you were saying that, you know, it messes with sleep and stuff like that. Um, is there a prevalence? I know, you know, you hear about um, military PTSD. Is there a prevalence of PTSD um, with peace officers, firefighters? Uh Yes, it is very high. I can't give you a stat on that, but uh, if, if you were to look that up, I think you would find that it is very high, the ones that are diagnosed. Uh, now, you know, cops, male and female, they tend to be, uh, you know, tough guys, um, kind of like the military. They don't want to admit that, hey, maybe I need to talk to somebody, but... Uh, it does impact a lot of police officers and firefighters because of what they do and what they see. Yeah, I, I, I know myself, I know someone who was in the military and uh, you know that, that alarm thing that goes off to check the alarms? Yes. Every time it happens, he hits the ground. Yes. And yes. you know, it's just, it's such a knee jerk. So it just seems like that would be really, really hard to shake you know, when you're off time. You well, a lot of people are confused, uh, really, what PTSD is. That, that can be caused by any traumatic uh, event in your life. Uh, just that police officers, firefighters, and soldiers tend to have a lot of those events in their life, not that uh, the most uh, people would have, where they might have one or two, but where the cops are uh, put in jeopardy every day or firefighters put their life in jeopardy. Um, and it, you know, PTSD doesn't mean that you're being shot at. That means, uh, there's a lot of things in the environment that can set that off. That's a, that's a good question as well. That's. I agree. I agree. Well, um, you know, in that same line, um, I, I come from New Orleans where people did shoot at people. <laughs> 
So, you know, we've, I've had bullets whiz next to my head. And so my question, when you were an active police officer, um, I know myself that my brain turns off when things like that happen. And I do stupid stuff like standing in the line of fire going, hey, stop shooting which I've done on two times, which is, not, I would never make it as a police officer, <laughs> but <laughs> surprised I'm still here. But what, um, can you even, re I mean, like what goes through your head when you're in a dangerous situation or does your, your, your brain can't turn off. So what, what goes through your mind? Well, your brain can turn off if you allow it to. Uh, that goes back to training as well. You always hear the uh, example uh, about the police officers running into the danger. Yeah. Um, where the, the normal reaction would be to turn around and run the other way. So, uh, you know, that's the way they're trained. They don't run away from the danger. They run to the danger. It takes a special person. And you do I have to be you do, runs. <laughs> you do have to be very cognizant of your surroundings. And uh, even though I've been retired for 25 years, I still am. I mean, things that I do and uh, people I talk to, uh, I still have that extra sense about me. So uh, you're always on guard. You're always watching out for what's going on. Uh, in your surroundings. I, I worked in a juvenile justice area and I got in the habit of always sitting, facing the door in the restaurant, always being behind people, always looking 90, 90. So that's, I, that's I hear exactly you. right. And that's the same training that the police officers get. And uh, <laughs> if you ever go into a restaurant and you want to know who is a cop in there, that's right. Look and see where they're sitting because it, it will tell you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, if, if it's okay to ask, did you always want to be in the criminal justice field? Uh, no. No, actually, I uh, started my my adult career life as an undertaker. And uh, I guess they're kind of related, but they're, they're service industries. So uh, Uncle Sam interfered with my life, though, and I went in the military and then uh, when I got out of the military, that I, that's when I thought about being a police officer. And they're all related. I mean, they're all service things. They're all, you know, help other people. I hear you. Well, um, like if somebody was thinking about being in the criminal justice field, um, but they wanted to, you know, like learn other subjects, what would be some really good, like, would it be the psychologies or the, the allied health or what would be good? Not librarianship, although we are <laughs> very well in what we do. Uh, well, let me add, let me add to your question in a little bit, uh, okay. to be a firefighter, to be a police officer, uh, in Texas, the only educational requirement is that you have a high school diploma. So you probably hear people say, well, you know, I want to work in clean, but that they require 90 college hours uh, that I have on a transcript. Well, that is not the state law. That is the local agency requirement. If you go to Copper Cove, they say, okay, if you want to be a police officer here, you need to have 35 hours of college. Um, not a requirement. Nice to have, but all you have to have is a high school diploma. So for all the years that I was a police officer, I went to school. I went, I came to CTC. Um, I got a bachelor's degree. When I ran out of that, I went and got a master's degree. After a couple of years, I went and worked on a PhD. And people always said to me, why do you do that? Why, why do you go to school? And because it was never required in the job for anything I did. So I did it because I wanted to, and I did it so that 
I'm not a police officer for 45 years. I was a police officer for 20 years, and I've been a college professor for 25 years. So uh, I always looked ahead to see, you know, where am I going to be in the future? Not where am I right now, but where am I going to be in the future? But along that line with that question, uh, there are we do have cadets and our students here that want to go on and get at least a bachelor's degree. And I tell them, and maybe I shouldn't say it on the uh, interview, but I don't always encourage them to go and get a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and a master's degree in criminal justice and a PhD in criminal justice. Um, I recommend like a sociology or a psychology degree. Um, for several reasons. I mean, it helps you understand and interact with people better. And it's also another career that you can branch off into uh, when, you, when you're done with your career as a uh, police officer. So there are ways to build on that, yes. And it really depends on what the individual's interests are more than anything else. Um, well, I know that some officers move up to detective or yes. forensics. Um, can you tell us a little bit about those? Have you ever done either one? Uh, yes, I have. I was a detective for many years. And uh, again, there's no educational requirement for that. It's, uh, it's uh, just a different position in the police department in most cases. Uh, a lot of departments do consider that a promotion, even though there may not be a, uh, a change in your pay. Uh, and again, that depends where you go to work. Um, it's to broaden your horizon and make you a better police officer. Um, when you're out on the road working traffic and you just write tickets all day, that gets kind of boring. Your productivity probably goes down. If I can move you over here and put you in crimes against persons, uh, sexual crimes, murder, homicide, uh, things like that, or put you in crimes against property, working burglaries, theft, uh, robberies, things like that, uh, kind of gives you another boost of energy and you broaden your horizon. You get more experience that way. And then when you promote up and become uh, part of the administration, then you already have that work experience so that when those people come to you with problems, you can't say, well, I never worked a murder case. Well, I have worked a lot of murder cases. So uh, good to be spread out and get that experience well um and let me tell you what there are so many facets um i recommend that everybody find a citizens police academy um i joined it in order to be able to walk in your shoes to see the other side of the coin you know because we always hear one side and i was not at all prepared for <laughs> <laughs> driving and, and, you know, going on drives and um, not prepared. I would have been a terrible detective. Uh, for instance, I would have stepped all over the evidence. So uh, do you recommend that people do this to kind of get an idea of what you guys are doing, you know, putting yourself in harm's way to protect us? I encourage everyone that I know especially my students when they come here and they're fresh out of high school and they are coming here to get a degree and they the only thing they know about law enforcement or firefighting or really anything else in this world is watch what they watch on tv or what they see on youtube so uh, they're very naive when they come here and we try to make sure that by the time they leave most of them stay here for five or six years to get a two-year degree but um, i encourage them if they have access to a citizen's police academy to go and join that and it will open their eyes and they will see what the cops do and they will have a much better understanding and i wish everybody would go through a program like that because people that normally see the cops as either a good guy or a bad guy there's no in between they because they don't have any understanding of what cops do and if we compare cops to firefighters, I always ask my students, have you seen the firefighters stand on the street with a boot and collect money? And they say, oh, yeah, 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 we, we, I've seen that. 
And I ask, do you give money? Yeah, 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 I give money to the firefighters. I said, if a cop did the same thing, if the cop took his hat off and stood on the corner, would you give them money? And they say, no, I would not. Because their image is cops are bad guys, firefighters are good guys. Firefighters save your life. Firefighters get your cat out of the tree. They put your fire out so your house doesn't burn down. Um, they do. They always do good things. And if you think about what happens when a cop knocks on your door, why are they knocking on your door? Because you broke the law. <laughs> because they have a warrant for your arrest. Because they have bad news. Their grandma died. Um, so when you see the cop, it's not always with that big smile on your face. Just so you know, you think, okay, this is something negative is going to happen to me. If they would go and go to the those academies, like you say, the uh, Citizen Police Academy, or even do a ride-along program with the local police, uh, they would have a much better understanding of what police do. I, I totally agree. Um, I think, you know, it's like the dentist. You know, people cringe when they have to go to the <laughs> dentist, so... You know, you, you you have to take the profession knowing what you're getting into. So, yeah, I, I agree as well. Maybe the dentist should um, have a visitation in the office so you can come visit a couple of times before you have to go get any procedure done. <laughs> listen, listen to the drills. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, um, that was the questions that the students had been asking us and we, you know, we, we didn't have any answers. So we really appreciate you taking the time to um, come and answer some questions for us. Did you want to leave any, any words or, um, or any thought for uh, students who are considering going into your department, going into yeah, your Yes, I always, I always have words of wisdom for my students. Uh, I encourage anybody that thinks that they want to go to the police academy uh, to get a degree in criminal justice, um, to work in the fire service. If they want to come by here and visit with us, feel free to do that. Uh, one thing I always brag about is that everybody that works in my department has been there. Uh, we, we don't just hire somebody out of college and they don't, you know, they come and teach class the next day. No, we don't do that. Uh, everybody that works in my department has been a firefighter or a, pl a police officer or a police detective or a sheriff or uh, a jail uh, correctional officer, probation officer, parole officer. We got a full gamut here. So there's lots of experience here. When somebody tells you, uh, about a case that they worked, a murder case that they worked. They didn't read about it in a book. They were there and they did that case. They prosecuted that case. They were in court. They provided the evidence. Uh, they tell you exactly what they did. Not something they read in a book or saw on TV. So they're hearing it from the horse's mouth. And a lot of people are mis, you know, they have misunderstandings about what the police and fire do. Um, they, they have already in their mind a preconceived notion of what cops are about and they don't know. Um, and I will tell you that it's better to be informed before you go into a program than after the fact. Now, if you come and get a two-year degree in criminal justice and decide, well, I don't like that, I'm going to go get a four-year degree in computer science. That's great. Nice to know information that you learned here, even if you don't use it in your career. And we do have a lot of people that just come get a degree and they don't ever work in the field. Um, it's different if you go to the police academy and you spend six and a half months of your life there or with the XP pocked 11 months of your life in the police academy and you graduate, go to work and don't like the job. In fact, we had a cadet that went through it, the uh, police academy, worked for a local agency, went to work the first day and quit the same day and he said because he did not know what police work was all about uh, so the more informed you can be before you jump into something like that it's kind of like you know being a paratrooper if you want to jump out of an airplane make sure that you know that it's a long way down before you jump out um, 
you, you have to you have to do your homework and that's the advice i will give you and if you want to do your homework come and visit us i can talk you out of it i can talk you into it uh, but you need to make the choice yourself do i want to spend that time do can do i have the personality to do that do i have the uh what it takes to be a police officer and it is a tough job and and it seems like you have to have an abundance of patience uh patience only one small part of that i think paul harvey said uh, a police officer is a saint and a sinner but you have to have patience and you have to have common sense and you have to be smart and you have to uh live on a small salary and uh, he summed it all up in a couple of paragraphs and if everybody wants to read that paul i give paul harvey credit for that and he said what is a policeman uh, good reading for somebody in fact if they come to my class i will read that to them or i will show that to them so that they can read it and it opens their eyes well, thank you so much today. And I know we were having uh, Facebook problems. And well, we're still we're having a little bit going. because I get a lot of, I'm getting a lot of hesitation there on the screen. So I have to make sure I can tell when you stop talking. So, uh, but that's technology and technology doesn't always work so well. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. But we, we persevere. We just we keep going. <laughs> we do. Well, thank you so much, sir, for um, visiting with us today and telling us, you know, giving us a little background of what's going on. And, um, you know, hopefully everyone, um, you know, if you've got further questions, we'll put in the comments um, the, co the contact or like Mr. Chalice said, go ahead and go on over and make an appointment and talk with him. So yeah, I'm, I'm always willing to uh, always willing to give a tour if they want to come see what we have here. If they have questions or they want to, you know, see what the cadet class does, or they want to come see what we do in our degrees uh, with our degree seeking students. Yeah, they're more than welcome to come by anytime. They can bring their parents if they want. Uh, uh, I know we have open houses scheduled, but. I know that, you know, everybody doesn't plan for those. And so, hey, if they're driving by and they say, let me make an appointment to go in there and visit, uh, they're more than welcome. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much today for, for um, visiting with us. We, um, we, we appreciate your time. We appreciate your talent. We appreciate the department. Um, <laughs> the fact that you're teaching people to protect us is awesome. So... And, and everyone, um, don't forget that uh, we our next uh, event is October 13th, Workforce Solutions. So um, we will see you then. Everyone, you have an awesome day and um, go visit Mr. Chella over there. Thank you. And thank you for the thank opportunity you. Uh, to speak with you. Thank you. All right. And you guys all have a great day. Okay. Bye-bye.